Hi, and welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams, and I'm here with my co-host, Billy Thomas, and we both work at the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources in the Extension. And you know, Billy, it seems like we can't disappoint people with jam-packed shows, and this is not going to be a disappointment. Yeah, I know, Renee. I'm really excited about today's show. We've got um, some really great guests, and we also have one of our undergraduate students here in the Department of Forestry who's been doing a special project with Dr. Ellen Crocker, so we'll hear more about that. Um, but we're going to be talking about what's bugging my tree. Um, Dr. Crocker's got a great segment on um, a new disease that's been found here in Kentucky um, that is threatening um, really a really cool tree, so we'll learn more about that. And um, we'll hear from um, Dan Root, who is um, an undergrad student working with her as well. Well, then we have Matt Springer with the um, Snake ID. Um, so looking forward to that one. Those are always a lot of fun. And we'll wrap up with our ever popular tree of the week. So a big thanks to everyone for joining us. And if you're joining us via Zoom, you can interact with us via the chat pod. And if you're on Facebook, please use the comment section and we'll interact with you there. But uh, glad to be with you today, Renee, on this hazy day. Hey, <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I think we've just recently learned what the haziness was. I know yesterday I looked up and the sky was really hazy in the sun you could actually look at it and it not kill your eyes you know but it was you know kind of it was different than what we're used to it really is and if people haven't been um, noticing or listening to the news you know the wildfires out west um, especially the ones in Oregon and California have just created so much smoke that that is making its way across and there's high level winds um, across the um, northeast and through the midwest as well and we're seeing it here in Kentucky so you know as you see those hazy skies just keep a keep a mindful eye of all all those firefighters out there trying to protect homes and property. Um, it's a really dangerous situation out there. And, and, you know, our hearts go out to all those folks that are being threatened right now. You know, I actually saw a report that says that this is such a strong fire. So it's actually causing its own weather. It, you know? really, it really is. They have yeah. these giant like fire clouds and and others you know where you just get all of this um, intense heat and right. you know and then we're it's starting to create lightning with no rain so it's almost kind of getting worse and worse on itself so you know yeah a lot of a lot of dangerous situations out there for our friends out west yeah definitely Definitely. So I guess we will move on to today's topics, though. And um, Dr. Ellen Crocker is going to be here to talk about Laura Wilt. Hi, Ellen. How are you? Hey, everyone. How's it going? Great to be on today. Hey, Ellen. For joining us. So today I'm going to be talking about a new invasive uh, issue in our area. It's called Laurel Wilt Disease, and it's caused by an invasive fungus that's carried by beetles that are also invasive, um, spreading it from tree to tree. And it impacts trees in the Laraceae, which for our area, for Kentucky, that's going to be sassafras and spicebush. So today I'm going to show you a little bit of kind of more information on Laurel wilt disease, what it looks like, um, how to spot it. And then we're going to talk with Daniel Root, who's been working with me this summer, um, who will show you how to identify uh, sassafras, because he's been doing a lot of scouting around for sassafras lately, as well as talk about his project a little. Are your sassafras struggling? There's a new invasive epidemic that's killing sassafras and spice bush in our area. It's called laurel wilt disease. Typically some of the first signs are wilt, early fall color, or browned leaves on trees. Um, but this disease can rapidly kill trees. On this edition of What's Bugging My Tree, we're gonna be talking about laurel wilt disease, what it is, how to spot it, and what it does to your trees. Laurel wilt disease is caused by an invasive pathogen and tiny little ambrosia beetles, also invasive, that move that pathogen from tree to tree. Both of these are thought to be native to Asia. All ambrosia beetles, and there are lots of them, both native and non-native, are fungus farmers. They bring fungi with them and put them in trees as they tunnel, and they actually eat the fungus. For the most part, these beetles are attracted to trees that are already stressed, and the fungus doesn't really hurt the tree. But in the case of the red bay ambrosia beetle, the beetles are attracted to perfectly healthy trees, and the fungus, once it gets in there, can become systemic and cause a major disease of that tree. 
Red Bay ambrosia beetles bore into trees and shrubs and introduce the fungus with them. Once it's in there, that fungus will move into the xylem and block up the vascular system of that tree, impacting the flow of water throughout that trunk. Death can occur rapidly, within a few months to a few years for sassafras. Laurel wilt only impacts plants in the Lauraceae family, the laurel family. In our area, this includes spicebush and sassafras. Further south, there are lots of other hosts, including red bay laurel and even avocado. Despite its name, mountain laurel isn't impacted by laurel wilt disease at all. It's in a different family that is not likely to be impacted in the future. Laurel wilt symptoms include initial wilting, those leaves looking like they don't have enough water, maybe a discoloration turning yellow, or a bright fall color, dropping leaves, symptoms that you might easily confuse with water stress. Dead sassafras leaves are kind of a reddish brown color and they'll remain attached to those trees for several weeks after they're killed by laurel wilt disease. Dieback might be centralized in one particular branch or part of the tree or throughout the whole canopy. In addition, you might get trees where the top is killed, but they're sending up new shoots out of the root system. The wood just under the bark in that vascular system can be really darkly stained with laurel wilt disease. You'll see these dark black streaky stainings, that's the fungus, in the tree as well as the tree's defensive response to it. If you look really closely, you might also see some tiny circular holes on the outside of the tree, maybe even some little toothpick uh, looking protrusions from those. That's caused by those red bay ambrosia beetles that are moving this disease from tree to tree. However, it only takes one introduction of the fungus to kill the tree, so you might not notice this, and those holes are very tiny. Laurel wilt disease is not the only thing that kills sassafras, from armillaria root rot to many other issues. If you've got declining sassafras, it's important to kind of look through all of those different symptoms to make sure what you're seeing is laurel wilt disease and not something else. Laurel wilt disease was first detected in Georgia in 2003, but now it has spread through much of the southeast, impacting 11 states already. It was first introduced to those coastal areas where wet bay laurel is the dominant uh, tree that's killed by them. Millions of trees have been killed. However, since then it's jumped further north uh, where sassafras is a more dominant uh, tree in our forests. It's still only about one to two percent of the trees in Kentucky, um, but nonetheless it's an important tree. It's beautiful, it's in a unique niche, one of those early successional trees that will come up um, into disturbed areas or old fields as they're returning to forests. Laurel wilt was first detected in Kentucky in 2019. Since that time, it's moved up through much of Kentucky from the western, southwestern part of the state, um, across other western counties, and even up into Jefferson County. As of 2021, it's in 10 counties. Currently, there's no treatment that can protect trees from laurel wilt. If you do find trees, you could consider cutting them down and chipping them to reduce those beetle populations. But even with that, we're not sure how effective it will be to control the populations of the red bay ambrosia beetle and to stop the spread of laurel wilt disease. Although ambrosia beetles can certainly fly from tree to tree, the main thing that's spreading them around, I think, is probably us unintentionally moving contaminated wood. Um, for example, firewood from counties that are infected to counties that don't yet have it. So a big thing that you can do is just not to move around firewood or any other wood that might have laurel wilt disease in it. Not only is this important for laurel wilt disease, but there are lots of other insects and diseases that we don't want to move around. Early detection of laurel wilt or any other invasive issue is key. So if you see something, make sure to report it to your county agent or the Kentucky Division of Forestry. Thanks for joining me today and learning more about laurel wilt disease. If you'd like to learn more, make sure to check us out online and follow us on social media. Thank you, Ellen. That was a great video. We greatly appreciate learning about that. We really do.
Yes. And, you know, it's never my pleasure to share information about um, new problems. Right. And this is not one that I wanted to see. I love sassafras and I love spice bush. Um, and just because we don't have that much sassafras, it's not as economically relevant. I think this is just another example of an invasive that comes in and attacks one of our trees and changes our forests. Uh, so not something I wanted to see and a challenge because there's not a lot you can do about it right now. Now there is some interest in doing some trials of some different fungicides for this. And if you live in one of those counties where it has been detected, and um, would like to participate in a fungicide trial, let, reach out and let me know. Um, and we could maybe connect you to some folks that are trying to do some research, understand can we protect large sassafras from this disease into the future? Um, and right now it's really all about stopping its spread, slowing it down to protect our other trees. Right. And Ellen, you bring up a great point earlier in your video there. Um, don't move firewood. You know, we see it and you can understand how it happens. You get a lot of dead trees yeah. in an area, more firewood than you can use. And then you want to kind of move it around or so. Um, yeah. And we've seen so many examples where that has introduced other pests. Um, and with Laurel wilt disease, there's an added um, uh, kind of challenge that that staining that I showed, that streaky black staining is not only kind of distinctive, but it's of interest to woodworkers and wood turners. You know, you see something like that, that's pretty cool. You might want it, you might want to move it around. Um, I'd encourage you not to <laughs> keep it locally. Um, it would be really easy because those beetles, the small red ambrosia beetles, they are so small, you would not notice them unless you're really looking for them. And then you can move it to a new area, then those can spread it from there. Yeah, and we want to protect those sassafras yeah. and spice bush. They're important mm -hmm. species for sure. So yeah, do your part. Don't move firewood. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of uh, working with sassafras, and I hear that you have a student that is helping you out. I do. I do. I want to um, invite Daniel Root. You can go ahead and share your video if you want, Daniel. So I've been fortunate to work with uh, Daniel for the second summer in a row. Last summer, he worked with myself in Kentucky Division of Forestry, uh, doing a variety of different forest health um, tasks. This summer, Daniel is working with me on a project where we're trying to monitor sassafras. And I'll let him tell you a little bit about that, um, as well as kind of, you know, what his interests are. He's an undergraduate student at the University of Kentucky in the Department of Forestry. And um, thanks, Daniel, for working with me this summer. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I appreciate you. Very blessed. Great. Well, Daniel, one of the things you've been doing a lot this summer is trying to find sassafras, right? Oh, yes. I've been uh, driving, not, not as much as last summer, but I have been, been driving the, the roads of Kentucky, searching various nature preserves and, and conservation areas and state parks and things to try to uh yeah so far the the areas that i've uh just randomly you know picked were were very had very good uh, locations for sassafras some very large ones too i i had a few that were at least 23 24 inches in diameter and those you don't see very often well daniel's gonna show you a short video um of you know, the skills he's picked up over these past years and how to ID sassafras if you're not already familiar with this species. How y'all doing? My name is Danny Root and uh, I'm gonna just go over a brief, uh, a brief description to help you identify sassafras. Uh, this here is a, is a small sassafras sapling. It has very distinctive leaves where you have almost the trident or three-lobed leaf. They also have uh, a mitten-shaped leaf. And then there's leaves that don't have any lobes on them at all. And these can grow from four to six inches. You can find very large ones. Uh, there are also, there's no serrations on them. The leaves kind of have a green bluish color to them. Uh, in the fall, they turn a bright, deep crimson red or orange color, which can also help, help you ID them. Uh, they do have kind of a dark green bluish fruit, which there's none on this tree at the moment. And, and the bark is very distinctive as well. It's kind of a blocky brown color. And both the bark and the leaves are very aromatic. Uh, the leaves kind of have, to me, it smells like Fruit Loops and the bark is kind of a more spicier uh, kind of smell to it. Where you can find them is on 
on lower mid to lower slopes very uh, productive very moist areas is where you can find them uh, they're kind of partial shade to full to full sunlight is where you find them uh, a lot of them grow I mean they can grow from you'll see quite a bit of them in this size but they can also get to large the ones I've seen they can get up to at least 30 to 40 inches in diameter and and upwards of 100 feet in the in the air Frequently you see them along disturbed areas like fence rows or right-of-ways and things. They're very small as, as they grow and they most of the time you'll find them they're kind of mid to uh, reaching the upper canopy. They're not really the dominant tree you'd see on a site but they're, they're kind of in the mid-story area is where you find them. A lot of times you'll find them on cut trails along the hillsides and, and such. Uh, so, so tell us a little bit about kind of the work you've been doing this summer and what you're trying to do. Well, using the, just the, the map of the, the areas in Kentucky, we're, we want to set up monitoring plots to, to try to understand, you know, areas where lower wilt is or, or has been confirmed and just to see how it moves through the area as far as the mortality rates and whatnot. And then also trying to figure out, you know, resistances if there's any trees on the site that are still uh, still, still kicking after it's all moved. But I'm, basically this is what I've been doing is groundwork. So I've been choosing counties that uh, have confirmed in and just drive. And most of them I've stayed, you know, in the Jefferson, Hardin County and the, the Barron County are the three areas that I've gone so far. Of course, a lot towards out west, you get a lot more of the active laurel wilt areas. And just going out there working, you know, scouting it out, finding areas where there's large size press. And then I've been uh, coordinating with the various land managers, nature preserve and, and things to, to get uh, access or, or grant permission for us to do research permit so we can go and tag the trees and, and measure them and uh, doing a little bit of forestry, you know, setting up plots and uh, recording DBH and things. And, and hopefully uh, we've got one, one area we finished. So I've got one area tagged and two more that I've got to do here in the coming weeks. So. Is this similar to like EAB where it kind of is just destroying every sassafras out there? but EAB with ash, obviously. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, in areas where it moves in, it seems like the, the amount of tree death is really high. So you don't get a lot of trees that are left, um, at least that we've seen in some areas with really large, big sassafras. And the beetles do seem to like those large trees the best. Um, you know, it starts with those big trees and then it will kill the smaller trees and then it might even move into the spice bush and some of the smaller stuff around there. But it's not gonna move into other species other than kind of the, the sassafras and spice bush. Um, we're lucky uh, in this area, we don't really have anything else that's gonna be impacted in it, but further south, um, uh, avocados are also killed by this disease. So it's a major concern to that industry and also to those of us who like to eat avocados. Right? <laughs> yes, um, count me amongst those, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Daniel, you're a, you're a senior in the forestry program, right? Yes, or you're this, going to be this, this fall. This coming fall, I will be a senior. Uh, uh, it's been uh, a very, I'm, I'm a non-traditional student, so I've had time in the military before coming here, but it's been a very, very informative experience, very exciting. Uh, I would love to pursue a, a forest health career, but I do understand that, you know, once you get your foot in the door, you, you're at the whims of what you can do, but uh, I'm very interested in, in protecting our forest and identifying you know, everything that's going on, I mean, are, they're under attack and there's so many things out there to look for. It's not just one thing. It's always five or six other things that you look for, but. Daniel, I was, I was gonna say, I've seen you advance through your career and, you know, these last two summers, what great experience you've had, you know. Um, was it forest health that attracted you to the field of forestry or kind of what brought you um, over to the good side of taking care of our forests? Well, Growing up, I've always lived in, in, you know, near the woods and I've always been attracted to it and, and just playing out in the woods and looking at all the, you know, bugs and animals and trees and things. And, you know, in the military, I was uh, in intelligence, so I, I didn't do very much with the woods, but 
you know, I did a lot with the, you know, maps and, and computer systems, but I've always had a call to, to the forest and, and, you know, I just went searching, you know, once I was through with the military and looking for forestry or and things of that nature and the University of Kentucky popped up and I was wow. happy to uh, apply. Well, we're glad to have you here um, for sure and appreciate all your contributions and you're working with really an outstanding extension specialist and Dr. Ellen Crocker. So um, I'm sure she's Very giving you great training. Oh, and I'm, I'm lucky to have you working with me for a second summer. I know that whatever you choose to do in forestry, you're going to have a really bright future ahead. Um, so thank you and thanks for all your hard work this summer. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Daniel, so much, really. All right. Oops. Speaking of trying to figure out what's wrong with your yeah. trees, <laughs> I think you have another little video there for us, Ellen, that uh, you created for so us. So we do have one more short video for you, um, just to give you a sneak peek on what goes on behind the scenes when you do submit a sample with laurel wilt disease or that you think might have laurel wilt disease. So we are so fortunate in Kentucky that we have phenomenal plant disease diagnostic labs um, that are you know, run by really great professionals who know their stuff. Um, but this video will hopefully give you a little view behind the scenes of what happens when you get a sample and take it to them. If you're seeing signs of laurel wilt disease, like wilting sassafras or spicebush, early fall leaf color or dead trees, we'd like you to take a sample and submit it to your county extension office so they can determine whether or not it is laurel wilt disease. But what happens behind the scenes once you submit your sample? And how do we know that it is the pathogen that causes laurel wilt disease? Join me today and we'll take a tour of the UK Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab to learn more about this process. Hi, this is Sarah Long. We're in the Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab. We're in the lab here on campus. Um, the Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab is a part of the UK Plant Pathology Department. Um, we have two branches of the Diagnostic Lab. Julie Beale and I work here on campus in the Lexington Lab and Brenda Kennedy works in the um, Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab in Princeton. Uh, we primarily accept samples from county extension agents, uh, but walk-in samples from landscapers and crop consultants, that type of clientele also come in. Um, for laurel wilt disease, we work uh, frequently with the Kentucky Division of Forestry, and um, all of those samples are processed here by the three of us. Um, we primarily use microscopes for routine samples for something like leaf spots on your tomato or your rose bush. Those would be diagnosed under the microscope. We also have other um, techniques that we can use, serological techniques um, such as ELISA. Uh, and then we also do culturing of certain pathogens. And a few samples even get uh, molecular testing DNA type work at our other facilities across campus. So today we're going to be talking about um, the spice bush and sassafras samples that get submitted to the lab for the laurel wilt disease. Today we're going to walk through the steps of what happens after you've scouted out a, a sample, you have a suspect uh, bush or tree that you're going to collect samples from. Those will get submitted th primarily through your county extension office and then once they get submitted to the plant disease lab here on campus. I'm going to walk you through the steps of what happens when we receive a sample suspected with laurel wheel. I have some spice bush and um, sassafras samples that have been submitted to the plant disease diagnostic lab for um, laurel wheel uh, confirmation. So we're going to look at some of the samples. So first thing I was going to show are some samples with some nice um, discoloration. This is going to be the type of symptom that we look for when we're isolating for the pathogen. Uh, if we can peel off the outer layers of the bark here, and you could do this in the field as well, but this nice dark discoloration on this living tissue is the best um, for nice clean uh, culturing. I, I shave this off and then um, surface disinfest the stem tissue and that will um, clean off any of the exterior uh, bacteria or fungi that are on the outside of the plant 
and then I cultured this um, discoloration in the hood which we'll demonstrate here in just a minute so this living shoots off of this um, this plant that would be an ideal sample if you're out looking for symptoms in the woods and want disease confirmation another example of a good sample that we've gotten in the diagnostic lab is some larger pieces I think these are larger pieces of wood that are from the trunk tissue uh, you can see the discoloration here and this type of thing the same the same protocol would be followed I would cut this into pieces and then isolate from this discolored tissue here this one was a really good sample it was nice and fresh uh, it doesn't have any um, dried out tissue which is harder to get the correct pathogen from that tissue uh, another type of tissue that we can work with in the diagnostic lab is uh, is branch tissue but typically smaller twigs like this are not as usable in the diagnostic lab for culturing just because it's harder to get that interior tissue where it's nice and clean uh, something like this that's maybe a half inch in diameter it is usable we would cut this into pieces and again shave off the exterior portions of the branch to look for that discoloration in the interior uh, samples that didn't work as well that were submitted to the lab this was a, a pieces of uh, bark tissue that had some bore galleries this one was a little bit dried out it was a little harder to work with um, anytime the tissue has been dead for a longer period of time and the secondary bores and fungi start coming in that that's a lot harder to, to isolate uh, isolate the pathogen out of tissue like this you can tell it's a lot more lightweight it's it's had some age on it so after a sample arrives we're going to um, we're going to find some nice clean areas where the discoloration is visible on nice fresh wood. It may be symptomatic, but hopefully there's no decay pathogens moving in on the wood yet. That's where we get the best cultures. And we will um, excise out the, um, the, discolorate, the discolored wood and um, there's a couple of ways that we can diagnose the laurel wilt pathogen. Uh, there are some newer methods where the um, the molecular the DNA from the um, from the fungus can be extracted from the wood, uh, but more commonly we um, we culture for the fungus, and um, the wood pieces of the wood would be excised out and surface disinfested. Um, that would clean off any of the um, decay pathogens that are on there or contaminants that might grow onto our, our culture. Uh, this is going to be excised out and then we surface disinfest it with 95% um, with alcohol and flame off the tissue to kill any of the pathogens. Hopefully not the pathogen we're looking for inside the wood but just exterior ones. And then those pieces of the wood would be cut into uh, smaller pieces on a on a culture plate and then we allow the culture to grow it typically grows for uh, seven to ten days and it'll grow nice um, white ropey mycelium onto a culture plate uh, after we've made the initial isolations we'll transfer them onto a fresh culture plate and then the fungus that's growing on the culture plate would go to our molecular diagnostic lab where they would run um, molecular testing from the uh, from extracted DNA of the fungus that's growing on the on the petri plate. If, or if you're going to go collect samples um, from your home or your wooded area, you can submit those through your county extension agent, and then they'll come to the um, to the plant disease diagnostic lab. Uh, either in Princeton or Lexington. Proper sample collection of fresh, nice symptomatic material is uh, key in diagnosing laurel wilt in Kentucky. Uh, with poor sample material, if it's dead wood, if it's fallen wood, um, it's not going to be usable for diagnosis. We have to have fresh material that's showing nice vascular wilt symptoms with the discoloration under the bark and um, Preferably fresh samples that are shipped to the lab or hand carried to the lab as soon as possible after collection. It's best to keep the um, 
the sample material on ice packs, preferably in a cooler. If it's going to be um, shipped overnight, it could even be shipped in a styrofoam cooler. That would be um, that would be ideal to get the appropriate pathogen um, out of the sample material. And we can only give you a disease confirmation from from samples that are usable for culturing uh, dead material. That type of thing is not going to be. Uh, successful in identifying laurel wheel. Wonderful. Well, so many thanks to Sarah Long for working with me on that, as well as Julie Beal in the lab here uh, in Lexington and Brendan Kennedy in Princeton. Yeah, what a You're great behind the scenes. Oh, sorry, Renee. No, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's yeah. you always wondered what happens once you get those samples in, and then you know we send them over there sometimes. Well, what happens after that? It was uh -huh. really interesting to see. You know, Ellen, I think a great takeaway from that was how important it is preparing a good sample, you know, so that, you I mean, you're going through the effort to get that sample and to get it submitted, um, but taking the care to make sure you're getting a sample that they can actually use is so critical. I know here in our department, we occasionally get boxes of shriveled leaves that have dried up and they're just crumbly and they're like, what tree is this? And you're like, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, good samples really make a, a big difference in that ID. So. Um, That's impressed. true. And with tree issues, you know, there's some things that I just like look at and, and I'll be like, oh, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. But if I really want to know, it's a pretty long involved laboratory process and the plant disease diagnostic lab, um, you know, they are uh, phenomenal what they do, but they can only do that with good samples. Yeah. Yeah, so if you've got samples, work through your county extension office. Um, we've got great agents and staff in every county in Kentucky that are there to help and support you. So um, utilize that great asset that we have. Definitely. Well, thank you, Ellen, for being on. Yes. Yeah, Thanks big, for having yeah. me on. Thank Although, you. sorry to share information about yet another invasive uh, that's attacking our trees. Well, so we need to know. Hopefully, we'll get good research to protect, better protect our sassafras into the future. Yes, yeah, excellent. Yeah, as always, thanks, Ellen, and big thanks to Daniel as well. All right, Renee, let's switch gears a little. Here's a little bit. So um, Dr. Matt Springer is here to let us know about some snake ID. Oh. Hello, yes, we're, we're back to our snake ID of the week uh, this week. Uh, and I've got a fairly interesting picture that was submitted. Uh, and one of a species, for whatever reason, has been filling my, my email lately. I've gotten probably a dozen or so this month alone asking about this particular species. So um, let's jump to it here. Uh, as always, whenever I uh, do these segments, I want to uh, highlight the Snake ID uh, website that we have uh, found at kysnakes.uky.edu. Uh, um, and so let's move into here our picture. Um, an interesting one, a little bit going on here, um, if you can't tell. Uh, it's actually this snake is in the act of con trying to consume its lunch, um, where we have a uh, snake trying to eat a toad. Uh, and it is a very common uh, dietary item for this species. Uh, so let's go ahead and move through and how we would ID this snake and figure out if, if it's a uh, species of concern to us uh, or one that uh, me, may actually want to just keep around the house, right, or in your property. Well, first and foremost, one of the, the best things we can do is try to look at the head. And unfortunately, in this situation, um, it's not that great of an image uh, of the, the uh, head. Uh, one, because it is currently wide open and trying to hold on to its, its, its lunch. Uh, but it's also got some leaves on, on over top of it. So it's blocking both uh, the head shape uh, and the, a clear look at the pupils on the snake. Uh, so we're going to have to go to the next step here and start looking at some other um, description items we can use uh, on the snake's body, right? So we'll move to pattern. Uh, and this snake does have a pretty active pattern, right? We've got a lot of black, yellows, and greens going on here uh, in a very checkery manner. Um, so what we can really tell is the snake has a, a moderate shape in terms of body. It's not super fat, although it probably will be if it successfully consumes this toad. Um, but in terms of, of body shape for snake ID, it's, it's a moderate body. It's not super thin and long. Uh, it's not super fat and short. Um, 
but it is a moderate size. And you can tell by the, the size of the acorn next to it there uh, that this is not a huge snake. It's probably about a, between a foot and foot and a half in size, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, so we take those and we can start looking at what's, what's available in terms of species uh, that have similar patterns uh, and also um, similar head shapes. And, and this one kind of stands out. Uh, now, this is actually a diamondback water snake found only in western Kentucky. Uh, that is not where this snake was submitted from. Uh, this snake was submitted from central uh, Kentucky. So this is not a, a possibility based on geographic region. Now, the next one uh, that has a pretty similar bright pattern and, and has uh, a little bit more variation in the pattern is actually a, a uh, almost entirely a toad eater. Uh, and that is our Eastern hognose here. Um, however, its pattern is slightly different. It doesn't have the checkering as much as it does banding. Uh, so this one is not uh, the culprit per se, um, but if we keep moving down the list, we do get to the actual answer, which is our common garter snake. As you can see, these guys have a, that checkery pattern to them, um, head shape lines, sizes aligned. Uh, there is a little bit of variation in the amount of color uh, in terms of dark to light. We, get, we see some that are incredibly light, like this example here, where we get into some darker greens, uh, a little bit more black, and that checkering is a little broader. Uh, into uh, some other individuals. And, and there's no locality that goes along with it. I've caught some in my yard that look like this and some that look a lot darker. Um, so it's a little bit uh, of a varying um, species in terms of their appearance, uh, but one that is completely harmless, uh, does eat a lot of toads, earthworms, and, and uh, other small um, prey items, uh, including a lot of insects. Uh, and one that does no harm in having around uh, your house or uh, on your property. Uh, and it can only do anything but benefit your ecosystem. Uh, unfortunately, they do tend to appear in places like gardens uh, and surprise folks uh, around houses uh, as well. Um, so um, relatively harmless um, in terms of, you know, they can bite you and will bite and strike at you to try to defend themselves. There is no venom. They won't aren't big enough to break the skin uh their biggest defense mechanism is to actually poop on you and it smells pretty bad um but one that we do want to make sure we try to keep out in the ecosystem if at all possible uh as always you know um you know, you want to make sure that if you do come across a snake, you identify what snake species you're dealing with. Remember that our venomous species in Kentucky have those cat-like vertical eyes, uh, pits, uh, as well as either rattles for our rattlesnake species, or, um, you know, we have the copperhead, which has a Hershey Kiss-like pattern to it, uh, or cottonmouth in Western Kentucky, uh, which are found mainly around water bodies uh, like swamps and rivers and ponds and lakes. Try to reduce snakes on your property or in your given area. You can reduce the shrubby areas around your house or garden. Keep your grass mowed short. Uh, keep your landscaping where there's not a lot of cover on the ground. One, it doesn't attract the prey that most likely the snakes are, are coming near your house to look for, uh, as well as it doesn't provide them a lot of cover from their own predators like uh, hawks and owls uh, and other birds. So you do those things um, and you won't hopefully be startled by any when you see them around your house. And also you will hopefully still maintain those great positive benefits that they provide the ecosystem uh, where you're located. Uh, and as always, we want to remind you that we have the UK snake website as a great resource for IDing your species, uh, or just wanting to learn a little bit more about what's, uh, you know, some of the 32 species we have in the state. And with that, I will take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Matt. We greatly appreciate that. And um, there, are, how many venomous snakes did you say there are in Kentucky? We have four venomous uh, species in the state. Realistically, we have three because of the one rattlesnake species is only found at uh, land between lakes, and there could be single-digit numbers of those left uh, with the pygmy rattlesnake. Uh, but central and eastern Kentucky, you have the, rat uh, the timber rattle uh, rattlesnake. Uh, as well as the copperhead and western you have potentially all three uh, where you add in the cottonmouth uh, or water moccasin. 
So not a lot of venomous snakes then. Not, well, not I mean, <laughs> you could be, we could live in Australia and it could be worse. <laughs> yeah, right. Where everything can kill you. Everything yeah. will kill you in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank you, Matt. We greatly yeah. appreciate you being on. Yeah. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's always great. And as a reminder, folks, if you ever come across a snake, you know, make sure you know what you're dealing with and leave it alone largely. Um, and if you need an ID, send a picture to Matt and we'll try to get an ID for you on a future show. I'll do the best I can. No, we know you will. <laughs> Matt, thanks for all you do. Appreciate it. All right. Have a great day. I will. Uh, all right. Moving on to our tree of the week. Yeah, and you know, this tree of the week is very fitting given what we heard in the first part of our show today about the laurel wilt and its impact on a very important tree species, the sassafras. So um, we've got Laurie Thomas is going to be providing um, the ever popular tree of the week and it's going to be the sassafras. All right. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the sassafras. Sassafras albidum is a widely distributed species known for its aromatic nature and variably shaped leaves. It is native to the eastern United States, and sassafras is common in Kentucky and is one of the first trees to grow in abandoned fields with the help of visiting birds that love to eat the tree's fruits. This is referred to as a pioneer species. It is a small to medium sized tree that grows up to 60 feet tall. It commonly root suckers and forms thickets or groups of trees like you see here. Sassafras is an early bloomer and it flowers before its leaves come out in early April. This species has yellow, male and female flowers on separate trees, which makes it dioecious. The leaves are deciduous and are alternately arranged on the twig, as you can see in the photo here. They are variably shaped and they can be entire, which means they have no lobes, or they can have two lobes, like a mitten or three lobes. They are very aromatic when crushed, as are the twigs. In fall, the leaves turn a brilliant red and look beautiful in the landscape. The fruit is a bluish droop that ripens in late summer. Some parts of this tree are edible for humans, but the fruit is not. The fruit is eaten by a variety of wildlife, including birds like the gray catbird, wild turkey, bobwhite, as well as black bears. The leaves and twigs are eaten by white-tailed deer, and the bark's eaten by rabbits. It is also an important tree for our butterflies. It is the host plant for the spicefish swallowtail and the eastern swallowtail butterflies. Sassafras is an attractive, lightweight, easily worked, durable wood. Where it's available locally, it's often used for small woodworking projects like this bowl. It's also used in the millwork industry and for paneling as well as post, railroad, ties, and cabinets. Sassafras root was one of the earliest New World exports. It was used to perfume soaps and make tea. However, today large extended doses of sassafras are not recommended since it contains a chemical called saffron, which may cause liver damage and cancer. Sassafras extracts that do not contain saffron are still used in some commercial teas and root beer. The Creole spice filet includes dried sassafras leaves, which are ground to a fine powder, which gives gumbo its unique consistency. The name sassafras was derived from the Spanish word salsafras, referring to the tree's alleged medicinal value. The specific epithet, or species name, albitum, refers to the light or whitish color of the underside of the leaves. The national champion sassafras as of 2021 is here in Owensboro, Kentucky. It is 61 feet tall with a 51 foot crown spread and 283 inches in circumference. To learn more about national champion trees, check out American Forest Champion Trees or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Sassafras grows best in full or light shade in slightly acidic, well-drained soils. It's a beautiful tree in all seasons, so hopefully you can get out into your neighborhood, a park, or your woodland and enjoy seeing a sassafras. Well, we always appreciate Lori doing those for us, and it does look like it's very pretty in the fall. Yeah, it's a gorgeous species, you know, and as Laurie indicated, important to wildlife and um, beautiful wood. So um, let's do what we can um, to limit that spread. Don't be moving any firewood if you can help it. Um, and certainly don't be moving any um, sassafras wood. Sure. Definitely. 
And I don't know, um, Ellen, if you're still on, I didn't know, would you want people to let people let you know about if they have any sassafras somewhere that they see Laura Wilt? Well, we have sassafras across the state. Um, and, you know, they're the kind of tree that um, is not terribly abundant, except for in some places, but it's pretty widespread. And you'll see it, you know, all over the place in those old fields and those roadsides, even deep in the woods. Um, so kind of in a lot of different habitats. Um, so you don't need to report sassafras necessarily, you can enjoy it. Um, but if you are seeing symptoms of laurel wilt disease, especially <laughs> if you live in one of those areas that's not known to have it right now, if you're in um, an area where it's known to occur, um, definitely you can still send some photos to your county agent and talk with them about what your options are. Um, but if you're in a new area that we don't currently know, you know, that it's there, um, please do. If you notice sassafras dying, if you notice that early fall leaf color or dead trees with the leaves still on, um, let your county agent know or let the Kentucky Division of Forestry uh, know so that they can uh, look at that further and determine whether or not that's actually Laurel wilt disease. Okay, great. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. Thank you. Good information for sure. Yeah. Renee, we covered a lot of ground today. We did. I think that's what we're going to just start saying every <laughs> second. <laughs> Uh, yeah, really appreciate all our guests and appreciate our viewers being with us um, each week. You know, we're trying to get information out that can be useful to you and your community. So um, please help us spread the word about this program. Big thanks to um, Dr. Ellen Crocker for updating us on what's going on with Laura Wilt and for her efforts. And as well, um, one of our undergraduate students, um, Daniel Root, um, a great young man that's going to be a great forester someday. So I appreciate Daniel and his efforts. Um, Matt Springer with a big um, snake ID, which is always a lot of fun. And then Laurie wrapping us up with the great tree of the week. So another good show and a, a big thanks to you, Renee, for kind of keeping us all together. Oh, well, I appreciate you being my co-host each week. Yeah. And you know, that if you uh, miss any of our shows or you just want to go, oh, what did they say about that tree? We, you can always go back to fromthewoodstoday.com and all of our episodes are there. So you can watch even our first episode if you wanted to. And now we're like some 60 episodes later. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, Renee, there's another upcoming opportunity. Real quick, I'll mention our 2021 Kentucky Woodland Owner Short Course is oh. going to be featuring both Dr. Ellen Crocker and Dr. Matt Springer. Um, that kicks off with some online sessions next week, starting next Tuesday evening. Um, and then we're going to have three in-person field sessions. So if you want to learn more about woodland health and what you can do, um, please go ahead and sign up for the 2021 um, Woodland Owner Short Course. And you can visit that at ukforestry.com. ORG, and we're at the very top of that page. So I um, look forward to having some of you all join us um, out in the field. And so you're kind of, uh, you said you're going to do webinars, but they're just doing four different webinars, right? And then then the in-person at, you can go to one of three locations. Is that it, right? Yes, ma'am. So uh, we've got four webinars that are meant to kind of be um, to get you ready for the field experience. Um, we're, we only have a little bit of time with you in the field, less than a day. So we're trying to kind of preload you with some information um, so that you're ready to kind of absorb that. So if you can't visit or be with us live on those webinars, they will be recorded for those who register and you can check them out before you join us in the field. But we have a field event starting on August 14th in Princeton and Western Kentucky. And then August 21st in Eastern Kentucky at UK's Robinson Forest. And then we're going to wrap up the series on August 28th at Burnham Arboretum and Research Forest, just a little south of Louisville and Bullock County. So um, please um, go ahead and sign up for that. And we'll look forward to seeing you all out there. And we definitely want, want, want everyone to sign up for that so they can uh, get some more information on about their woodlands. Yep. All right. Well, folks, thank you again for being with us each week. Um, we greatly appreciate it. We do. So again, we couldn't do it without you. And you can go to fromthewoodstoday.com and give us any kind of ideas. Uh, we, we take suggestions and we run with them. And so uh, just let us know if you have any suggestions whatsoever on that. But if not, um, on uh, Wednesday at 11, we're on every, every Wednesday at 11 o'clock. So you can just join us live or you can watch us later. So until then, take care. Bye. Bye, everyone.